Every vault was in some sense a test. These are the words of Timothy Kane, the creator of Fallout, in a video about the true purpose of vaults in the series. It inspired me to make my own video on why each vault had evil human experiments, which you can check out right here. But I didn't cover every single vault. I left out the control and non-canon ones, as well as the vaults from Fallout Shelter. So here's a video to fix that. This is why every vault in Fallout is evil, volume two. Built as an expansion to the Cheyenne Mountain Complex in Colorado, Vault Zero is the largest vault in the franchise, and arguably, the most significant. It was designed to oversee the entire vault network across America, with the power to study and control every individual vault. According to Gareth Davies, a designer on Fallout Tactics, Vault Zero was, quote, the nucleus of the vault network housing the greatest leaders, artists, and scientists, the inhabitants of Vault Zero were to reunite the vaults and lead the people to a new life, a new world. But after the bombs, the world would be a harsh one. To ensure the creation of a post-nuclear utopia, the vault dwellers would need help. Machinery was constructed to tame a land hardened by the ravages of war, then tempered by nuclear winter. That machinery was a calculator, an advanced supercomputer planned to monitor the vaults and facilitate protocols for aiding the wasteland. It would work alongside the smartest humans to guarantee the greatest likelihood of a brighter future, launching an exodus protocol when outside radiation levels were low enough. Vault dwellers from the various control vaults, or survivors in the remaining vaults, were to be brought to the surface with the help of a machine army who in true enclave fashion would sterilize any mutant life to make way for a new, purified America. Being the nucleus of the Vault Network, Vault Zero served as the heart of Vault Tech's mission. Every evil that had been done to prepare for the future, every cruel experiment performed was for the sake of Vault Zero. At the cost of humanity, Vault Tech would be saving it through this vault. The plan didn't work out. Issue number one. Unlike the other residents in Vault Zero who were cryogenically frozen for their talent and intelligence, there was a select group of geniuses who weren't entirely preserved. Only their brains were. These genius brains were then linked up to the calculator, with the plan being it would symbiotically use them for coordinating plans and for processing power. This Already sounds bad, but then you get into issue number two, the way the geniuses were chosen. The brains are to be harvested from a select group of geniuses that were chosen by committee for their skills and their cute haircuts. This was the genuine mindset that went into electing the calculator's brains. But you know what? Let's just ignore the fact that the overseers of humanity's revival lost their minds. Let's look into their final picks for brains. They had a whole bunch of visionaries to choose from, so how bad could it be? We have a game designer, an evangelist, uh, a lawyer, a doctor, an artist, a politician, and a scientist. To be fair, this is actually a good outcome. The original plan was to have rodent brains power the calculator. Plus, Maybe this wasn't inherently bad. Maybe the calculator could have benefited from a diversity of human personalities, no matter how unique. Even if they weren't up the snuff, surely the advanced supercomputer designed to save humanity would be. And it would have gained a wealth of perspectives and experiences to learn the true depth of a human life. The true value of saving us. Except there was one final issue. Issue number three. Due to severe budget cuts and reallocation, the $24 billion meant to go into the calculator and its systems became $2.3 billion instead. The rest of the money went into simple pleasures. Senior committee members were paid, smoke rooms and piano bars were built, and two entire underground hunting grounds with rare animals purchased from zoos were constructed. 
In other words, Voltec's savior of humanity was underfunded. This would become apparent when the bombs fell, and the calculator did absolutely nothing. It essentially just slept through the apocalypse until an army of super mutants breached Fault Zero. With the emergency pacification protocol activated, the calculator awakened, slaughtering the mutants and inadvertently killing the majority of the vault population. Due to the low budget systems, an electro organic linking terminal was damaged during the reboot and resulted in 63% of the population's deaths. 15% received significant brain damage, and of the survivors who were entirely fine, none were capable of fixing any of the calculator's flaws. The only two scientists who could have made any difference were dead, and soon, the survivors without brain damage would be as well. Operating without any quality systems or guidance, due to a degradation in its brains and potential replacements, the calculator took to carrying out the pacification protocol, exterminating mutant life as it was thought to stand in the way of the pure vault dwellers. However, that mutant life included human survivors in the wasteland exposed to radiation. The machines killed indiscriminately, and the calculator served as the villain in Fallout Tactics. It is important to note that while the game is non-canon, only some of it is. Some like Fall Tactics is is there's some stuff from Canon that from Fall Tactics as well. So for all we know, Vault Zero may or may not have gotten the retcon axe. Either way, it's clear that Fallout Tactics development studio Microforte had their own idea on the true purpose of the Vault experiments. For the pre-war American elite to learn how to properly emerge from nuclear devastation and rebuild society. It just so happens that this idea might be the one Bethesda goes with. In the new Fallout titles, there exists the Societal Preservation Program. This initiative was directed by Dr. Stanislaus Braun, a German scientist who was both the creator of the Garden of Eden creation kit and largely responsible for the Vault experiments. We know this from Fallout 4's loading screens, but we also get to see a letter Braun sent to Vault 101 threatening its overseer to carry out its initiative. We can assume that other vaults received similar treatment and were forced to perform experiments in fear of vault tech cutting off crucial resources or systems. Things should all click together once you realize that Braun was the overseer for Vault 112, playing God within the virtual reality pods, toying and torturing his residents for the fun of it. It makes sense that this is the type of person to create such an initiative, but he wasn't alone. This was a coordinated effort, and more than that, the effort itself was for the alleged good of mankind. The reason Volt experiments were done was to study test populations in order to presumably create an ideal population that would lead us out of the apocalypse. Perhaps the idea was that by pushing humans to their extremes, one could discover the strongest candidates for humanity's reconstruction, or ways to bring about a better, brighter mankind. Now, we don't know everything Bethesda has planned for Voltec as of the moment. That being said, the Societal Preservation Program does seem to be the route Bethesda is going with the vaults. That would mean Tim Kaine's generation ship reasoning is unlikely to pan out, Still, I do have the suspicion we might get some kind of space answer. For reasons we'll get into later in the video, Voltec has increasingly been shown in a space age light, which could provide a clue where the vaults are planned to be heading. There's also such a thing as secrets within secrets, orders within orders. I'll fully admit it is convoluted, but so's real life. So I'm gonna break this down as best I can. Let's say you have an institution. There's a power structure to it, and at the very top, you have the inner circle. These guys have the most power, and operate with the most info, since knowledge is power. That's why the second circle, though bigger than the first, is less powerful. There are more people, but they don't know as much as the inner circle does. They're operating with less. Then the next circle has even less than the second, and so on and so forth. Now, let's apply this to Voltec. 
What if the true intention behind the vaults is to find a way to make a good generation ship? This would be the most confidential, tightly kept secret reserved for the innermost circle only. For the next circle, all tech scientists and overseers are fed the societal preservation program to give them an ideal to work for and justify their inhumanity. Then citizens are told the vaults are safety shelters, and you can sort of see how this works. The vast majority are left without a clue. The next level is just given a half-truth, and the full reality is only ever reserved for the true puppet masters and their most reliable assets. People have wondered why vault staff would be kept outside the loop like this. Why never tell them about the generation ship plan? Well, why lie to the public about the vaults being safety shelters? The survival of humanity was at stake. Telling the truth to citizens could compromise the mission to save mankind. Who wants to be a human guinea pig, even if that info is for the ultimate good? Likewise, if vault -Tec staff knew about the ship, that's a problem. Thousands upon thousands of people are going to be vying to get on board something that couldn't house them all. And that's just being optimistic. There's always the chance the ship was only meant for the American elite, no matter what. To reveal something this grand to staff is dangerous. Research could be compromised. Hostile factions could crop up looking to find the ship and force their way onto the space crew list. That's not even getting into the people who naturally wouldn't want to leave Earth to live in a cold, cramped ship, drifting for generations into the dead of space, never able to touch grass again. To realize that this is the grand survival plan for mankind might cause some issues. With all that said, we ultimately don't know what direction Bethesda will take with vault in the future. But what is certain is how only some of Fallout Tactics is canon. That means Vault Zero and its purpose is in a state of superposition. It is both canon and simultaneously non-canon. Schrodinger's retcon. In any case, in keeping with Tim's generation ship idea we talked about in Volume 1, I'm making a retcon of my own. Vault Zero, or some sort of command center vault like it, was built at the Cheyenne Mountain Complex, which happens to be located within the Cheyenne Mountain Space Force Station. Being the biggest vault built within a military station specifically preparing space operations, it would have been able to store the resources and staff necessary to plan for mankind's ascension. Construction of the ship would be aided by the vault network data, which would go into determining how to implement technologies and protocols for the ship. And the calculator would use genuine big brains to help the Vault Zero residents prepare for the future. But somewhere along the way, things changed. By Fallout 2, the Enclave president Dick Richardson was carrying out plans to rid the world of so-called near-humans to make way for pure human life. The only way for true humans and democracy to be safe is to cleanse the mutants from the globe. We humans will take back that which is rightfully ours. This is going to be a huge stretch, but what if Vault Zero's plans were essentially put on ice? After years of nepotism and politics in the Enclave, years that made it clear how bioweapons and nuclear fallouts wouldn't leave the Earth inhospitable after all, the Enclave's mission was subverted. Higher up started opting for easier solutions than how to guarantee a generation ship survival. Rather than abandoning America and the entire planet, the Enclave began wanting to cleanse them instead. This would bring about the genocidal Enclave we get in Fallout 2 and 3, looking to end mutant kind. Until Fallout 2 and 3 left the Enclave railing. We know that their remnants are out there. Maybe Vault Zero is too. Personally, I think it could make for a good late series twist to learn about the true nature of the vaults, if it's properly executed. Also, for the sake of the video, I'm still going to be using the Starship theory, but just know that the vault studies on tech and behavior could easily fit some kind of ideal Earth society instead of a spaceship, in case it doesn't end up coming true. Featured in the tech demo for Interplay's cancelled Fallout 3, there's little we know about Vault 1. 
What we do know is that it would have been in the game's tutorial and in a state of disrepair, even before the bombs fell. The generator was out, which in turn meant that the computer and life support systems were down. The iRobot who could fix these problems had issues of its own. And even the overseer, a vault's prime authority figure, was absent. In his place was Frank the Underseer, who was to be in charge of the vault until the overseer's arrival. The poor guy says he's not off to a good start, and he's not kidding. It's as if Vault Tech did everything they possibly could to put Vault 1 at a disadvantage. Which makes me think that was entirely the case. Give a Vault a bad start and see how it fares. If a population without any proper, competent authorities can't untangle one heck of a mess right out the gate. It might make sense that vault -Tec was trying to gather data to see if a space crew could handle problems on the ship without authorities. Say some type of civil war breaks out, or something gets loose on board the ship, leading to the death of its authorities and damage to its systems. You're now left with regular crew members to clean up the mess and figure out electing new leaders. In other words, you're back to square one. So. Can a crew survive that? Would they need to clone authorities or bring folks out of cryostasis, or can they be trusted to fix things on their own? In that regard, Vault 1 could have provided some useful data. Another Vault 1 is featured in the Fallout 76 holotape minigame, Wastelad, a game within a game developed by Huber's Comics Game Studios. The game is styled and named after Wasteland, which the original Fallout is a spiritual successor to. Home to the Wasteland and other proper red-hating Americans, Vault 1 stands against the evil communist military leader, Chairman Ming, responsible for bringing about Wasteland's Wasteland. There's not a lot to be said about Vault 1 because it's a literal work of fiction in a work of fiction, and kind of a basic control vault from the looks of things. But I will say that the game is quite clearly propaganda, not displaying the true nature of vaults. Huber's comics did produce propaganda for vault -Tec in the past, so it's not much of a stretch to suggest their game studio would as well. You'd hope they were just misinformed about the true nature of the vaults, but maybe they were actively lying about them. What's also interesting to note is how one of the companions you can take from Vault 1 is Mr. Pebbles a cat in a spacesuit. Talk about predictive programming. Vault 2 is also featured in Wastelad, except this one has a definitive theme. The vault is really into sports, to the point that the outside of it is still adorned with local sports team paraphernalia. They also listen to holotapes on pre-war sports games to pass the time. In Wasteland, Vault 2 serves as a kind of late game barrier, requiring that the player give it an old sports jersey in order to be allowed entry and exit out the other side of the vault. It would have some kind of alternate exit, which I find interesting. The vaults tend to be one door kind of deals, which has led to catastrophe before in the case of Vault 34. It's my own headcanon over a tiny detail like this but I like to think it's evidence of Huber's comics' misinformed optimism on the state of vaults, or their way of conditioning people into falling for their supposed safety. Vault 3 was one of 17 control vaults that Vault Tech built. I've mentioned the control vaults before in the series, but I haven't explained what they are, so let's fix that. You know how every vault is an experiment? Well, in a scientific experiment, the experiment is usually performed on two different groups, experimental groups and control groups. The experimental group receives a variable, while the control group doesn't. This is in order to see what influence that variable has. Similarly, Fallout has experimental vaults and a select few control vaults. A regular vault had an obvious variable, while the control vaults didn't. In fact, the control vaults almost seemed like how vaults were advertised to be, fallout shelters built to truly house and protect people. This has led to a pretty big misconception amongst fans where they think the control vaults were the true safety shelters built for protection compared to the experimental vaults. But that's wrong. 
Canonically, the vaults weren't made to save anyone. While the control vaults were safer, they were still always intended to be tests just to see how long a vault could last, according to Tim Kaine. And sometimes, they still had some mild variables thrown in anyways. That being said, they weren't nearly as bad as the experimental vaults, and it makes sense that the control vaults were comparative to spaceship life. To be fair, that would also be something of an endurance test. The control vaults were basically representations of average life on the ship, so studying to see if they would last or why any would fall apart would be important in the design process. If a control vault of all things, with no prepackaged issues whatsoever comes undone, the spaceship isn't going to fare much better. Knowing what went wrong and how to improve is critical, especially with failures like Vault 3. Vault 3 was a peaceful, democratic community which lasted generations. But in the 23rd century, its vault dwellers were put to the test when a water leak forced their hand to open their door and start trading with the outside world. Sadly, this ended with the vaults being taken advantage of by the Fiend's group of raiders, who entirely annihilated them. Generally, the control vaults seem to have different times they were set to open. This will be elaborated on later in the video as we cover each of them. But in Vault 3's case, it appears that the vault was to remain closed. Yet, its leaders were much more accepting of opening it to the outside world compared to, say, the isolationist Vault 13. And while there were isolationists in Vault 3, its overseer George Stoltz and the people that elected him were willing to greet the outside world. This leads me to believe that there were no directives given by vault or government higher-ups with regards to opening the vault door. Maybe only a standard warning of raiders and mutations, but nothing more, leaving Vault 3 to naturally decide when it was time to leave. It also leads me to believe that the vault's opening could be study material to determine directives for a generation ship crew when they finally land on a planet and it's time to go outside. Learning these conditions that led to a control vault's opening and its inevitable fate would give vault good data to use in creating a stronger ship, as well as stronger protocols to give to the space crew. They'd be learning when to leave the ship upon reaching the final destination, and how to leave, thanks to tragedies like Vault 3. Mentioned in design documents for the cancelled tactical game Fallout Extreme, Vault 6 was meant to be located at Mount St. Helens in Washington. The actual experiment wasn't in any of the documents that I found, but it is talked about on various Fallout wikis, so make of this what you will. Apparently, the experiment of the vault was for small doses of radiation to be leaked into the vault every day, eventually causing the entire population to turn into feral ghouls. Similar to Vault 12, which studied the effects of radiation on a population in general, it seems vault wanted to further understand its effects, only this time at lower levels. Maybe they wanted to know if the lower levels would change how quickly the population would realize they were being irradiated. Scarily enough, Vault 6 ended up being significantly worse than Vault 12, with less radiation than the latter. On a spaceship, there would be reason to fear radiation leaks, which Vault 6 seems to be mimicking. Whether there's a leak in the atomic-powered systems, or an issue with the ship's shielding from cosmic radiation, space crew members could potentially be exposed and suffer the consequences. Knowing the fate of Vault 6's inhabitants would be good study material to determine whether to invest in radiation detectors or designing more effective protocols to avoid such a horrifying event. Vault 7 is a vault featured in Fallout the board game, more specifically, its New California expansion. Built beneath the surface of a lake, the vault is said to be a dangerous one. None who have set out to explore it 
have ever returned to tell of the place. Equipped with a rebreather or some mighty confidence, you swim down into the depths, only for the vault door to open. No matter how hard you fight against the current, it drags you inside, with the door shutting behind you, trapping you in the pitch darkness underwater. Assuming you don't drown, you explore a series of dark corridors until you find a room with a working computer. Its records reveal that Vault 7 doesn't have anyone living inside of it. In fact, no one ever did. Rather, it appears the Vault records info on anyone who finds their way inside. You even find a computer entry made just for you. Additionally, you learn from the terminal that a robotic guardian runs the place instead of an overseer. You also learn Vault 7 has 154,440 different configurations, and a current high score of 42. Searching for a map of the vault results in computer access being denied at best, and a trap going off at worst. One can even inject you with FEV that turns you into a super mutant. But say you luck out and it's just computer access getting denied instead of your humanity, you read that maps violate something called Leviathan Protocol. Interesting. Upon surviving the vaults, you'll be congratulated by a message saying you've completed the Leviathan. So, Vault 7 is the Leviathan, and it's not really a vault. More like an automated obstacle course, with the final gift for surviving it being Vault Security Armor. Thank you, vault -Tec. But why call it the Leviathan? Well, it's a biblical creature representative of chaos. So A, underwater reference checks out, and B, the course has over 100,000 configurations. It's a chaotic, random death machine much like the Leviathan. This is one of the non-canon vaults, but it's still fun speculating how to fit it into the spaceship theory. So my take on it is, Vault 7 is some kind of final challenge planned for the space crew's security team trainees, a ritual to prove themselves and earn their place as proper space authorities, with the armor being symbolic of that success. In a way, it's like a military training test. And throughout mankind's history, military training has been intense. It's supposed to be pushing, disciplining, and hardening people into a capable fighting force of an authority. It can also just kill them. Yet, in a cold, utilitarian way, that would be acceptable for vault -Tec. Perhaps for any nation. You want strong warriors. You want to see who can get a higher score than 42. Maximum score has been 280. I expect you to do better. And to be fair, compared to a wastelander with no training and junk guns, I highly doubt the final version of the test would be sending people in who weren't prepared. It'd be dangerous, but nothing they weren't trained to handle. Just like the simulations. Trainees get through the obstacle course, they secure their place as one of the ship's trusted authorities, as long as they get through alive. Vault 8 was a control vault, opened two years after the Great War. Its inhabitants made use of the Garden of Eden creation kit, aka the Gek, to terraform the outside wasteland and create fertile ground. They then went on to create the stable, prosperous community of Vault City. This is basically the best ending a vault could have, and while everything seemed to go right for Vault 8, something actually did go wrong. See, the vault didn't receive two geks like it should have, instead receiving an extra shipment of water chips meant for Vault 13. Vault 8's central computer documents this incident as a shipping error, which the president also backs up. An unfortunate and unforeseen accident, however, as it turns out, a rather fortuitous one. While one could argue that this was in fact intentional, I think the most concrete test this vault had was to see how an early opening would affect a population. 
The two years of time spent in this vault would have been nothing compared to other control vaults, where people lived inside for centuries. Perhaps vault Tech was essentially studying if Vault 8 would be ready for the outside world and surviving it so soon. The dwellers could have easily chosen to remain inside the safety of the vault for centuries if they wanted to. Kind of like how one could remain inside a generation ship for centuries after landing at their final destination. If given the choice of safety or colonization, which would a population pick after just a brief amount of time? Is it a good idea to keep the doors locked for years on end? Or could you open them relatively quickly? Would the crew be ready and responsible enough two years later, or is it a better idea to make that 25 years? How about a couple hundred? I think in part, Vault 8's success may have influenced such a decision. Vault 10 was never used in Fallout 4, but it appears in the game's art book. All we see is a jumpsuit for it, and that's literally it. Likewise, there are a bunch of vaults throughout the series that have art or unused assets made for them, but we have absolutely no idea what they'd be like or what their experiments were since there's so little info about them. As a result, they won't be covered in this video, but who knows, maybe one day they'll be elaborated on in a future game. I'm always down to cover them in a volume 3. Vault 13, the vault that started it all, the original name for the Fallout franchise, and the first vault we see within it. Vault 13 was a control vault built to house and protect pre-war Americans. We learn this from the Enclave president himself. Vault 13 was a special case. It was supposed to remain closed until the subjects were needed. Vault 13 was, in scientific parlance, a control group. However, there was a unique test behind Vault 13, and one that kickstarts the original game's campaign. According to the Fall of Bible, Vault 13 was intended to stay closed for 200 years as a study of prolonged isolation. Over the years, its overseers maintained an isolationist vault that did not venture outside. But 84 years after the bombs fell, Vault 13's water purification ship broke. There were no replacements due to the shipping error mentioned earlier, and the overseer was forced to send inhabitants outside to find a replacement ship. Simply put, no chip equals no drinking water. No water, no vault. That meant the player character, also known as the Vault Dweller, was sent out as well. They found the chip and defeated the super mutant threat posed against the vault as well. But upon returning home, the vault dweller was exiled by the overseer. Having experienced the outside world, they were now seen as a dangerous influence to the community. Everyone will want to talk to you. Every youngster will look up to you and want to emulate you. And then what? They'll want to leave. What happens to the vault if we lose the best of a generation? What if we are the only safe place in the world? You just gave us back all these lives. I can't take the chance of losing them. I've made a lot of tough decisions since I took this position, but none of them harder than this one. You saved us, but you'll kill us. I'm sorry. You're a hero, and you have to leave. This is the extreme consequence of Vault 13's isolationist experiment. Even the Vault's champion, a hero worthy of myth, was exiled, sent out to die. Furthermore, Tim Kaine states that part of Vault 13's test was that it was not made to last. It was made to see how long a vault could last, as the people would need to remain inside and try to find workaround solutions to any technical issues or system failures. On a generation ship, there's no help coming. There's no resources to be gathered outside to fix any problems inside. 
just the utter oblivion of space. Fault 13 somewhat mirrors what a starship would go through by maintaining a group's isolation in a small metal community. The starship wouldn't be too different compared to the vault. Except, at least with Vault 13, a person can go outside to find replacement parts for their vault. On a starship, all you have is what's given to you. I'd like to think that the study on Vault 13 would go towards logistics data on how many system repair parts to assemble and store on the generation ship, as well as how long the ship could last on its journey. This could even factor into the planet chosen as a final destination. Think about it. What does a control vault's survival time say about the durability of a generation ship? Do you go with the somewhat habitable rock that's decades out and just invest more into terraforming it? Or do you go with the Earth-like planet centuries away, at the risk of the entire ship being dead before arrival? Canonically, in Fallout 2, Vault 13's purpose was for the Enclave to house a control group of people who would be used when the time was right. That time came about during their genocidal plan to rid the world of near humans. The Vault 13 inhabitants were forcibly made into test subjects for the Enclave's FEV toxin. Being pure human stock unaffected by radiation all their life, they were tested to see if they would have an inoculation against the FEV which solely killed mutant life. So, even as a control vault, Vault 13 was pretty bad. Its inhabitants were forced against their will to aid in the near extinction of near mankind, and the whole place became the graveyard of the talking death claws that the Enclave engineered to help in the vault's abduction. Although, depending on who you ask, that last part may be a good thing. Thankfully though, a second apocalypse was averted and the people of Vault 13 would join the ancestor of Vault 1's exiled protagonist to found a new, even more prosperous community than the one they lived in below. Vault 17 was a vault invaded by super mutants who forcibly converted the inhabitants into more mutants, including Lily Bowen, a nightkin who could become a companion for the player in Fallout New Vegas. Other than the invasion, we don't really know anything else about Vault 17. We can assume it was a control vault based off the fact it lasted as long as it did. Lily mentions growing up in the vaults, having been 75 years old with grandchildren when she was converted to the super mutant cause. So it was likely another vault similar to Vault 3 and 13, with the goal being to see how long they could last while shut. Vault 31 was featured in Fallout Shelter as part of a limited time questline called The Mystery of Vault 31, released for the fall season. Vault 31, like October 31, get it? This spooky vault was rumored to be haunted, and it didn't help that no one who visited the place ever returned. As it turned out, a gang of raiders had taken over and was just spreading scary stories about it in order to keep people away while they robbed the place dry. But where was vault security in all this? How does a vault just get taken over? Well, we do learn quite a bit from another vault in Fallout Shelter called Vault 700. While talking to one of its dwellers, you can bring up how it seems vault Tech skimmed out on internal security with their vaults, which he'll agree with. Keep this in mind when we cover the rest of the Fallout Shelter vaults. It suddenly makes a lot of sense how they're just easily getting overrun and conquered. It also adds that extra bit of wicked corporate corner cutting to them, which is no surprise in this series. Vault 32 and 33 are set to be featured in the upcoming Amazon Fallout TV show. We've got some leaks to work with, but it's always risky showing this kind of stuff. So I'm going to limit myself to some photos that I think I can get away with including. If this bit of the video is blurred in the future, you'll know why. Starting with Vault 32, we know it has an underground farm. Also, right beside its crops is a wooden fence and shack, which is something we haven't really seen in any of the Fallout vaults so far. This is just speculation, 
but maybe Vault 32 is planned to be an experimental vault with the intent to better replicate the world that was left behind. Instead of cold, mechanical rooms for crop harvesting, you'd have something that at least tries to make you feel like you're farming on Earth's surface. Meanwhile, from what I could gather online, Vault 33 will be the vault that the main characters live inside of. It's located in Los Angeles, and if these photos are anything to go by, it may be in contact with the NCR. They're also willing to bring a ghoul inside, so they're likely not as isolationist as Vault 13. Personally, I'm not interested at all in the show. After Rings of Power, I've done some preparing for the future of my own. But if the show ends up being alright, let me know in the comments below and I might do a short update video to cover these vaults in more detail. Vault 39 was set to appear in the cancelled Fallout Brotherhood of Steel 2. According to the game's design documents, it was set to be located in Lone Star, Texas, and was known as the Abilene Vault. It was practically a jungle filled with giant mutant plants trying to kill the player. But rather than being a test from vault -Tec, the plants were a test from the game's main villain, a man named Miles Reese. Reese was part of the Cypher's group of raiders, a gang that hated technology. But Reese wasn't like the other Cyphers. He hated both technology and the Brotherhood of Steel who revered it. Most people rejected his message, but Reese rejected the Brotherhood of Steel so much he wanted to go to war with them. So he got down to business. He did his research and discovered the existence of the Gek. Figuring it'd be key to making a better world, Reese found the nursery an ecological zone in a canyon of Denver, Colorado, designed to be a self-contained oasis for a post-war humanity. It's where the Gek was made, and it's where Reese found a stored prototype for the miracle device. Now traveling to the Gulf of Mexico, Reese left a trail of mutant flora in his wake, toying with his prototype Gek, and working towards making a new Eden upon the Earth. A new world without humans. Okay, so yeah, you got a little too lost in the sauce. And Vault 39 was most likely intended to show some of that, giving us a glimpse at the danger posed by Reese and his Gek. We don't know what the original Vault experiment was going to be, but we do know the experiment it ended up becoming. To demonstrate the power of a weaponized Gek. Vault 44 is another one of New California's vaults, and was built to secretly house and study mutant creatures. Beneath the upper levels, accessed only through the Overseer's console, are hallway-long circuits. Creatures are chained to the floor and walls by tethers of electricity, and an automated feeding process shoves food into their pens. Yet, the upper levels have no food and starve to death. So what happened here? Well, like Vault 81, the residential area didn't know about the scientific one. Except in this case, not even the Overseer knew about it. According to their terminal logs, the Overseer claimed to hear noises beneath the hatch, but couldn't open it. They also said that something in the vault was drawing too much power, and that for this reason, the refrigeration unit had failed. With a lack of food and the vault door unable to be opened, the upper levels perished. Things weren't much better down below. You find the corpse of a skeleton down there, whose final report is displayed on a nearby computer. No uncontaminated food left. We locked up the infected in the lower levels and are waiting for a response from vault -Tec. Whatever the result may be, I shall carry to my grave the consciousness that at least we meant well. Piecing things together, the scientists likely ran out of their own storage of food, much like the top floor. Their food was likely tainted due to some kind of mutant exposure, the same kind of exposure we see in the upper levels food storage, which is due to a mutant infestation. 
The tainted food also likely caused the infections that we hear about. Meanwhile, any uncontaminated food that was purely meant for the animals that could have saved the scientists was guarded by robots, one of which is found riddled with bullets. A sentry bot can even mistake the player for an escaped animal before attacking them. So, it's likely that any attempt to steal edible food by the scientists was met with a misguided amount of force. I think the purpose of Vault 44 was to find an ideal way of sending mutant creatures into space. Making an arc filled with natural earth creatures is one thing. Adding mutant Brahmin might raise some eyebrows. Although, you could argue people would get used to two-headed cows. But rad roaches? Death claws? Who would want these things on board the ship? Why feed these abominations instead of good, mutation-free people? I made the argument with Vault 96 that vault -Tec was looking to put mutants on the ship to serve as domestic animals or bioweapons for the planet's terraforming efforts, but that ignores the human factor. See, the Enclave wants the ship. How are their people going to like living next to mutants when their ideology involves being mutant-free? Frank being an exception, of course. Maybe vault -Tec saw this situation ahead of time and strive to make a vault that attempted to hide mutants while caring for and studying them to see if this would rectify potential problems. Simply put, it didn't. Vault 76 is located in Appalachia, West Virginia, and is the vault the player emerges from in Fallout 76. In Fallout 3, a citadel terminal entry reveals some of its purpose. Vault 76 is one of our 17 control vaults. It will operate exactly according to the plan dictated in the marketing material produced by vault and precisely to resident expectations. This vault will open automatically after a period of 20 years, and the residents will be pushed back into the open world for study in comparison to the other experiments. However, in Fallout 76, we learned that the opening date was actually 25 years, in an event the vault celebrated as Reclamation Day. It would have been a recolonization effort carried out by the vault inhabitants, who are each worthy in their own way, being incredibly smart, talented, or well-connected. They were also highly competitive, and the Vault 76 overseer recognized this. To maintain order, she issued a number of rewards and competitions to help keep her residents satisfied. She also prepared them for Reclamation Day as it approached. But here's where things get strange. Before Reclamation Day, the Vault security team made a request to the Overseer. They asked for permission to arm the Vault 76 residents before any left the Vault, because otherwise, the population was just going to be sent outside with nothing. While the Second Amendment doesn't seem to apply to ordinary Vault life, surely it would make sense to give a colonization effort weapons for self-defense. After all, this is a mutant-filled wasteland, and one has to protect themselves. However, the security team's request was denied. The Overseer didn't allow her residents to have any weapons to deal with the outside world. And then, she left the vault before anyone else did. This doesn't make sense, so I looked into it. And it still doesn't really make any sense. Except I do see a couple reasons for this to go down. The first being the Overseer's secret objective. To ensure vault -Tec's control over local nuclear missile silos in Appalachia. Keep in mind that the Overseer did allegedly care about her vault dwellers, but she was committed to the vault -Tec mission of supposedly rebuilding humanity and ensuring its safety. She was aware of the societal preservation program, and the vaults being experiments meant for mankind's reconstruction. Sending colonizers out with weapons could cause a scenario where they find the silos, seize control, and prevent her or other vault authorities from safely controlling them. 
In other words, the Overseer likely saw it as a necessary evil to make her population powerless. Now, I do have a second idea why the Overseer did this. What if the Overseer didn't want factionalization right out the gate? The Vault Dwellers were already competitive without weapons in the Vault. What would happen once they had guns? Once they were free to roam around the world and do whatever they wish? There's only so many resources in the Wasteland. Add ego and human temperament to the mix, and it's a recipe for disaster. We've been talking a lot about Tim Kaine's space idea, but we haven't discussed the game Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri yet. It's a 4X strategy game about a starship fleeing the Earth after a war. In this setting, the UN launches a starship named Unity on a colonization mission to another world. But Unity didn't last amongst the passengers. The ship's captain was assassinated, and the leaders that were left factionalized and fought one another on the planet. What was meant to be a unified mission became a brutal war over ideology and resources. Because, as Ron Perlman has told us for decades now, War. War never changes. But maybe the Overseer of Vault 76 wanted something different. Maybe to ensure that her people wouldn't war with one another, she didn't give them any weapons on Reclamation Day. She didn't want the resurgence of mankind to be plagued by petty wars and tribalism. To see if she could accomplish this, she created a weaponless colonization effort. Yet, that didn't work out. It really, really didn't. As a result, Voltec would have more control vault data on how a society fears upon opening up to a new world, and it probably would have contributed to making the ship a totalitarian nightmare. If some of the brightest, worthiest pre-war citizens couldn't help themselves but to nuke each other, there's a big problem with humanity that vault going to try to solve somehow. That isn't going to end well either. Vault 84 holds an annual vote to exile one vault dweller who is seen as a danger each year. A vault lab worker explains the process as such. Once per year, we pull the entire vault for who they think is a traitor. The person with the most votes is exiled, though getting any votes can leave you ostracized. There's a lot of paranoia around traitors in the vault, and the player is immediately mistrusted due to being an outsider, especially for appearing right before the vote. To make matters worse, Vault 84 knows of another vault, Vault 109, who they used to contact and swap supplies with until communication with them was lost. Fearing the worst, the vault dwellers in 84 don't want to meet a similar fate, so they're fine carrying out the vote. Keep in mind that, unlike what Bethesda would have you believe, a vault dweller isn't always a protagonist in the Fallout series. They're not all prepared for the outside world. Most of Vault 84's residents aren't doing so good out in the wasteland, if they're even still alive. And while there is a charity in Vault 84 to help the exiles out, it can only do so much against raiders and slavers. But the Vault carries out the vote anyways, because, as far as they know, they're saving their community. They are exiling dangerous people and threats to their loved ones. What they don't know is that the exile process is not meant to help them. It's obviously an experiment, and according to the computer of Overseer Hayes, the concept of the traitor comes from a pre-war fabrication perpetuated for psychological study. This year, suspicions fell on the Overseer, so for the first time in a hundred years, she was willing to accept an outsider entering her vault, even breaking in, which technically you do. Either way, she saw an opportunity to use fresh blood for the vote. With this info, it can be leaked during the vote. Outraged, the community votes for Overseer Hayes, giving her the same punishment she had forced onto so many innocents before her. 
But what was the purpose of the experiment? Why exile people all this time? From the overseer's computer entry, we definitely know the idea of a traitor was for psychological study. But I propose the study carried out by Voltec was to determine the complacency of a population with regards to ostracizing and exiling their fellow man. We already saw an extreme example of this with Vault 11, with its test being to see if the population was willing to sacrifice innocence for the safety of the majority. In that case, their complacency was also tested, and they failed. The fear of danger toward the majority led to innocents being killed and other human atrocities. Likewise, the fear of danger toward the majority in Vault 84, that there were dangerous inhabitants inside who posed a risk to the community, prompted people to send innocents out into the wasteland, which was basically a death sentence. Voltec would have been gathering data to see the ease in which a population becomes okay with demonizing and essentially killing their fellow man. Another potential reason for the test was to study the influence of authority. For Voltec, it would help to know that a simple authority figure could get away with convincing their crew to exile or sacrifice anyone deemed a traitor for a very long time all without some scary computer to threaten a population with, just someone with a high enough position and a strong enough lie. Vault 93 is a vault that presumably housed sports players going off the sole non-feral ghoul in the vault who says he was a quarterback for the Rockville Ravens before the war, and the fact the player discovers the vault via strange radio signals emitting from it which sound like old sports broadcasts. Perhaps Voltec wanted a population with pure athletic ability to study the success of certain genes or traits getting carried onto future generations. We already know from Vault 75 that Voltec was interested in eugenics, so it wouldn't surprise me if Vault 93 was some sort of generational test. It also appears that the entire vault save one became feral ghouls. Whether this was due to intentional radiation exposure or some accident, we don't know. Assuming it was intentional, maybe Voltec would have liked to know if a stronger, more athletic individual would be impacted by radiation exposure the same way a non-athletic person is. Vault 109 is a vault with some serious high-end supplies, such as a working fat man which even the vault's manual warns people about. It also had high-end fashion. The place is modeled to look like a sort of shopping center, with clothing to buy from high-end fashion stores. There's even a fashion runway to top things off. At some point, the place became highly irradiated and overrun with super mutants who are now very stylish thanks to the local clothes. We also see from the overseer's computer that the whole place was under surveillance, my theory is that the experiment surrounding Vault 109 was to study the effects of spoiling a population. If they had access to high-end clothes and equipment, would complacency creep in? Would the dwellers trade their survivalist mission for simple pleasures instead? Clearly, something went horribly wrong, and the dwellers couldn't handle it. This would be good data to have to see how far a ship should go with providing amenities to its people but it might also shine a light as to how closely the ship should replicate the old world. Perhaps it's not a good idea that people be reminded of what they're leaving behind. Forever. As we know in the world of Fallout, old world blues are a real thing. And they're a hell of a thing at that. Enough to destroy a man. And just maybe, enough to destroy a vault. Vault 120 is a cut vault from Fallout 4 that would have been entirely underwater. In a Reddit AMA, Todd Howard mentions it being a Bioshock-inspired location that would have had a giant sentient octopus or squid. Triangle City has a great video breaking down the place and the cut quest tied to it, 20 Leagues Under the Sea, which I'd recommend checking out. From what can be gathered, Vault 120 is filled with hostile robots, as well as various barricades and ruined rooms. 
The vault would have had a research station where experiments were done on mutant aquatic life, including dolphins. Uncut from Fallout 4, the Institute has a bioscience terminal that shows there's actually interest in creating sea creatures since, mentioning the difficulties of making an aquatic habitat. So, as Triangle City suggests, maybe the Institute just attacked Vault 120, carrying out its destruction to take over its research facility instead of building one from scratch. Now with all that explained, I have to talk about the giant sentient squid with Deus Ex brain augmentations. Namely, that it was going to be the Vault's overseer. Had it not been cut, I think Vault 120 could have actually gone down as one of the goofiest vaults in the series. I also think vault Tech wanted a scenario sort of like Vault 11 with Vault 120, except nothing sacrificial more like some type of test on a population's reaction to having a non-human authority and whether they would stand up against it. The vault is in part a research station for experimenting on sea life, so maybe the idea was to see if people could go classroom dissection on their cephalopod leader. There's also the fact the vault is underwater where there isn't any easy way of leaving. This would mirror the state of a generation ship's population who also couldn't just walk out the door. In Vault 120, there was only a couple escape pods available, and who knows what the dwellers were told the surface world was like if they were willing to put up with robots destroying their home and a talking squid. Maybe the vault would be a study on forced inhabitancy, and if that would persuade people into following or disobeying authority. Keep in mind that all Vault 11's population had to do was not follow orders for its door to open up to the outside world. Vault 120's population would be, well, 20 leagues under the sea. That's a big difference, and it might cause one too. Vault 120 is also a vault that was featured in Fallout Shelter. It was the victim of the editor who would essentially dox vaults and send raiders to invade them through a wasteland newspaper called the New Boston Bugle. No experiment is mentioned or shown, so it's hard to speculate about its purpose. That goes for quite a few of the vaults from Fallout Shelter, which is basically a tongue-in-cheek spin-off game rather than anything serious. I'm still going to cover them all, which is a lot. So brace yourselves, we're going to be tearing through these vaults. Vault 144 had inhabitants who became death cultists due to a typo in their vault manual, making the word death capitalized. Whether that was intentional or not, who knows, but the consequence was a death cult. Maybe the vault served to study subliminal messaging similar to the studies on Vault 19, 92, and what we'll later see in Octurus 1. Vault 144's data would be good for conditioning space crew to stay in line, or quite literally worship the ship's mission. Vault 177 was taken over by a raider group who had kidnapped Bottle and Cappy from Nuka World, and was part of the Nab from Nuka World questline. Vault 189 was part of the Hot Tub Slime Machine quest. Rumors had begun circulating the wasteland of this vault being an oasis of pleasure, having everything from a sauna to a hot tub. As it turns out, the vault was infested with mutants and the pool had been drained years ago so the inhabitants could have drinking water. Perhaps Vault 189 was designed around the dilemma of pleasure versus responsibility. Clearly, the vault needed drinking water at the expense of the former pool, but maybe vault wanted to know if a population would give up a luxury for a necessity. Maybe they genuinely thought things could go either way, so whatever result they got would factor into the level of strictness behind rationing protocols on board the ship. Vault 199 was considered a cheap vault and suffered an infestation of mutants that the player helped squash. Its sister location is Vault 899, which 199's inhabitants call classier. How do they know this exactly? Did local vault registration give you options for what vault you could opt into? Were people explicitly told they were settling into a cheaper alternative? I'd assume this may have been a compare and contrast test between the two vaults. If one vault knows it's cheap and another knows it's top class, what's the reaction going to be? If you think you're in a poorer vault, are you going to treat it like one? 
What behaviors are people going to display? It's a big stretch, but I think the vault would make good study material to know both the impact of perceived quality and the impact of language. The First Amendment is sacred for a reason, but it'd probably be given the Vault 13 overseer treatment if it was discovered that talking about the state of one's metal prison home affects the population's morale or ethics. Imagine if someone calling the generation ship worthy of a nuclear winter causes the star crew to, say, act a bit different. So, strict rules on language may have been planned based on the study results of Vault 199. Vault 226 was meant to house Vault Tech's least punctual employees, and none made it to the vault on time before the bombs fell. Being punctual means doing something on time, which the employees couldn't even manage to do to save their own lives. It's likely that Vault 226 was a test to see whether non-punctual people could be entrusted with residency on board the ship. Crew regulations would definitely be a thing, and if there was any evidence that the Vault 226 residents couldn't survive or function, it could have swayed decision making for the space crew list. And for a good reason, from the looks of it. Vault 232 is a vault you explore looking for Racky Jobinson's jersey for a quest. Nothing else to really say on it. Vault 233 needed repairs that took longer than expected, and had a door that wouldn't seal. As a result, the overseer moved their residents to lower levels and activated a distress signal to no avail. The dead vault was eventually occupied by raiders. It kind of seems similar to Vault 1 and 12, and I have to wonder if the study was a sort of mix of the two. In the face of mortal peril and radiation exposure, could the crew coordinate together to save themselves? It's very cruel to think about, but maybe, unlike Vault 12, Vault 233's door could have been repaired through some kind of workaround, but the overseer was too overcome with concern for his residents, moving them to the bottom floors to protect them, and inadvertently dooming them. Either way, dead vault. Vault 242 was a vault comprised of creatures instead of humans. The generation ship would have likely contained animals, including mutants, so it would have been good to know how they'd fare inside containment. It also could have been good to learn what adjustments or safety measures to take with the ship design compared to the vault, say if the creatures were frequently getting inside the air vents or walls. Vault 261 was part of a limited time Thanksgiving themed quest, No Thanks for the Gobbler, where it was the origin of an experimental death claw known as the Gobbler. Making it to the vault, the player would meet Dr. Doting dressed up like a pilgrim who explained that the Gobbler was her experiment to infuse the DNA of a wasteland creature with an insatiable hunger for preservative-rich food. All in the name of science, of course. Similar to a vault like Vault 36, it makes sense that experiments testing the willingness of a subject to eat heavily processed, chemical-laced backup food would happen. Except this vault actually studied animals instead of people. That sounds a little bit better at first, until you realize that DNA editing is the end goal to ensure that subjects like to eat this stuff. A death claw is one thing, generations of innocent people are another. Vault 314 had a mutant infestation. Vault 315 was part of the Wizard of Water questline, having opened its doors to trade with the outside world. They bought alleged miracle water from the so-called Wizard of Water, which turned out to be non-magical whatsoever, and they got raided right afterward. Vault 317 contained clover samples, considered in-game to be a hardy, nutritious weed believed to be extinct. I assume the vault was meant to store plant life to reform the wasteland or take the plants into space. Vault 322 is a vault which contains one of Vault Tech's deep agents codenamed Moly, who has a massive vault conspiracy to tell the player. All this time, vault has been experimenting on Vault Dwellers for years. 
Volt 333 has issues fending off a local raider gang. Volt 390 is overrun with raiders. Volt 404 was destroyed thanks to the editor. Volt 428 is a bunch of ruins. Volt 450 was visited by the Brotherhood of Steel for its technology. Volt 505 was comprised of game developers working on a special project that would allow Vault Dwellers to play games on their Pip-Boys. The Vault then got overrun by Rad Roaches in a quest called The Debuggers. Clever. Old Pip-Boys couldn't run the games and required a special expansion card. Even then, the games were battery hawks. Also, it appears that Vault 505 had a number of objectives that were being reset due to the Rad Roaches frying the mainframe circuits. According to one of the Vault producers, once an objective was met, the Vault populace would carve the words good job on a slab of rock before crushing the least productive team member under it. Vault 505 seems to be a parody of game companies, but perhaps we see some of the subliminal messaging technology at work here. Vault 512 was invaded by two giant rad scorpions that the Vault was no match for. Vault 666 was not featured on any official Vault registry and served as the lair of El Diablo who acted like a stereotypical villain. Maybe the vault was kept a secret compared to the others to mitigate the chances of vault tech employees traveling to it. This could have been another subliminal messaging vault, but one that would have served as more of a control experiment compared to other vaults with subliminal messaging. Those vaults had a chance of being exposed to outsiders or vault tech personnel who could have potentially broken the effects of the mind control. By keeping someone mind controlled in isolation for a long duration of time, maybe Voltec wanted to see long term effects or potency of the technology. Volt 700 was invaded by a raider group called Ruburbs Raiders, who punctured the reactor, causing a good chunk of the vault to turn into feral ghouls. Even the overseer became a glowing one. Speaking of Volt 700 getting attacked, that's also what happened with Volt 711 which was also taken over by Ruburb's raiders. Ruburb Mitchell was a former Vault Dweller who got fed up with the hard work vault -Tech was putting his fellow Dwellers through, and so he decided to rise up, start a raider gang, and liberate some vaults. They had a join or die policy which worked on Overseer Zilski. In the end, however, Ruburb thought that running a vault wasn't really for him and was willing to just peacefully live and be overworked in yours. Vault 730 was overrun with raiders and rad roaches. Vault 778 was filled with raiders who held settlers hostage. Vault 789 was filled with ghouls who survived the blast, but were transformed by the radiation. Maybe this was another Vault 12 type of deal, or a case of Vault Tech skimming out on rad protection. Vault 813 had an overseer who was aware of a Vaultopolis telling players to search vault offices to find info on its location. Vault 819 was overrun by vermin due to the amount of residents trying to attract the attention of the new boss and Buggle. They were willing to endanger their fellow residents for a small chance of fame. Vault 840 and 844 are completely filled with ghouls. Vault 850 was overrun by feral ghouls and has an overseer who's a dog. An overdog. The Vault Dwellers seemed to like him enough, and they even say he sent out the distress signal. When asked how a dog became Overseer, one of the residents says he was the most qualified, obviously. What's that, Overseer? You want to go with them? I suppose I could run things while you're gone. So either these people have clearly lost their minds or are under some type of subliminal influence. Alternatively, the experiment around 850 was to see if people would put up with an authority who wasn't an AI or squid, but instead was man's best friend. Either way, it seems to have loosened some screws. Vault 899 was the sister location of Vault 199 and was considered classier. They did have a salvage team, which is definitely a step up. Like I said with Vault 199 earlier, I think the test was to see the influence that perceived quality has on the vaults. Would knowing you're in a classier, more stable setting affect your behavior compared to knowing you're in a poorer one? Vault 899 seemed to be doing a lot better than Vault 199, so maybe so. Vault 909 was filled with raiders who had radical rad scorpion pets. 
Vault 923 was overrun by rad scorpions, and Vault R41D was a new vault created by raiders, part of the quest A Pale Imitation. It truly was a pale imitation, to the point that the raider boss asks to join the player's vault instead. It's funny and a little scary seeing the influence of the vaults in the world of Fallout. Even some raiders think of them as civil and safe, unaware of their true nature. Arcturus 1, also known as the Voltec Among the Stars exhibit, was featured in Nuka World, a Nuka Cola theme park parody of Disney World. More specifically, Arcturus 1 was located inside the Galactic Zone section and actually goes further than a simple collaboration project. The exhibit was manned with Voltec sales staff, since Voltec and Nuka Cola were in cahoots. More than being a sales pitch for Vault registration, Arcturus 1 was yet another experiment upon the public. Using visitors as test subjects, anyone who visited the exhibit would be subjected to a number of conditions, including radiation exposure and subliminal messaging. And there's no excuses to be found here. vault staff was very much aware and in on it. However, there's yet another twist to this place. One that even the staff, including the technician deliberately carrying out poisoning families and their children, were unaware of. Unbeknownst to them all, project lead Louis Bateman was testing them too. This is the perfect example of the Secrets Within Secrets model I was showing earlier. Bateman was really the only person aware of the full truth of the experiment. Meanwhile, vault staff were given half-truths and understandings rather than the big picture, and the poor visitors were left entirely out of the loop. It's like the skeleton of the ship theory at this point. And speaking of which, the theory does get a small boost by Actorus 1, vault amongst the stars. The name says a lot, but there's more clues. Right off the bat, we're greeted with Arcturus, being one of the brightest stars in the night sky. It's also seen in the constellation Bortes. Bortes the Herdsman. Uh oh. Now, I'm not calling Arcturus a future destination, because it's this. But maybe scientists who are figuring out a good planetary replacement for Earth would choose a planet close to Arcturus or something with a nearby star like it. Then you get to the rest of the exhibit, which is basically what a vault would look like on another world. I'll fully admit, this could all come down to the fact that Nuka Cola is space themed already, and also that Starfield was in development at the time. Some of that game could have definitely leaked into Arcturus 1, like how its radiation leaked into the skin of kids. But who knows? Maybe it's not far out there to assume it might be foreshadowing something to come. A vault that was truly preparing to be amongst the stars. Brad Burton's vault was the private vault of John Caleb Brad Burton, CEO of the Nuka-Cola Corporation. Think about that for one moment. A vault built for just one person. This man had the money for it. But Brad Burton wasn't satisfied with just having his own vault. He needed to guarantee his survival. So, he made a deal. Approached by General C. Braxton of the US military, asking that Nuka-Cola Corporation's chemists help produce weapons and initiate Project Cobalt, Brad Burton agreed, on the condition he'd get into the Leap X program also known as the Life Extension and Prolongation Program. Brad Burton didn't just want to survive Doomsday for a long time compared to the other vaults. He wanted to live forever. Realizing this, Braxton tried to convince Brad Burton that the program was still in its infancy and still had quirks. Still, Brad Burton was adamant. No Leap X, no signature on anything. Miraculously, Brad Burton got his wish. It's just one he'd come to regret centuries later. 
If you've ever heard of the Disney frozen head theory, then you'd know the fate of John Caleb Bradburn. After spending generations stuck like this, he doesn't want to live anymore. Worse yet, Bradburn has spent the time all alone, with absolutely no one to keep him company. The man wanted to preserve himself at all costs, but he didn't think to preserve anyone else alongside him. Bradburn's fault isn't so much a test or an evil experiment as it is a symbol of Bradburn's pure selfishness. Every budget cut back to the park was for Brad Burton. Every lack of funding park safety or the team members who were busy dealing with food riots back home was for funding Brad Burton's personal safety and survival. It's like Braxton told him before the war. You know, maybe immortality is what's best for you, Brad Burton. Be a goddamn shame to let that ego go to waste. The Brotherhood of Steel Automated Training Center is a repurposed vault that serves as the tutorial in Fallout Brotherhood of Steel. Outfitted by the Brotherhood of Steel to train new initiates, its original purpose was to serve as a prototype for a secret vault which is seen in the end of the game. Speaking of which, located in the former city of Los Angeles, the vault Tech Corporate Vault, also known as the Seeker Vault, was vault -Tec's very own private vault. It was designed for vault -Tec staff to remain safe and continue experimenting on FEV, including a variant of the virus stored inside, which was to be further studied and advanced. Furthermore, the corporate vault was looking to cure sterility associated with mutation, as well as some other things we'll get into later. But first, I have to admit, I made some mistakes with volume one of the series. And chief amongst them, I didn't consider Vault 87's experimentation with FEV being meant for the stars. I thought it was just meant for the war effort, but as commenters have pointed out, it could have easily been used for a space journey. Keep in mind that FEV is pretty flexible and not just intended to create super soldiers. Its intention is to evolve humanity as seen fit. Creating the perfect human for spacefaring is as much a reason to tinker with FEV as creating the perfect war machine, assuming there's no kinks in the process. But that's what tinkering's for, and that's what the corporate vault was doing with FEV. They were presumably trying to cure its biggest hiccups, including the one the master nukes himself over in Fallout 1, the sterility that FEV causes. As for other research, the vault experimented with restoring organic tissues damaged or mutated due to radiation. It comes in handy after the player character, the initiate, is injured in the vault, but I can imagine it helped during the space flight or colonization effort as well. Say there's a radiation leak and tissue is damaged or mutated on board the ship. Put that regenerative research to good use and you'll have a crew member good as new. Even a grave injury could hopefully be healed. Finally, installed inside was a unique AI named Kalix designed to maintain the facility. In line with other vaults with AI assistance, it was likely that the generation ship would have some kind of AI guide to help human overseers maintain crew stability and critical systems. When Kalix is asked what the vault research was for, we are told that its true purpose is classified information. What we do know is how the corporate vault ended up. In this case, I don't even have to call the vault evil because that's exactly what Chief Security Officer Blake did before starting the Civil War, having seen the inhumane FEV research done on humans. The war damaged chunks of the vault. Survivors remained inside the vault while Blake left and founded a ghoul cult called the Church of the Lost. Sometime later, after the Master nuked himself, the Super Mutant Army was left masterless, including General Addis. He wanted to give the remaining army an advantage in their war against mankind, so he began looking into FEV. When Addis heard about the corporate vault, he hatched a plan, breaking into the vault and killing its top layer. There, he awaited the Initiate's arrival to steal their key to the research labs where the FEV was stored. And while Addis got his wish, 
it did have some unintended consequences. Similar to Brad Burton's private vault, the private corporate vault of vault was a symbol of selfishness. While staff were perfectly fine with giving the general public unsafe shelters to live in, they made an exception for themselves. And worse yet, they were willing to carry out horrific experimentation on people. In the end, the corporate vault faced the same fate it was designed to avoid. The demonstration vault was built in Los Angeles, and was another vault private vault. According to Fallout's lead designer, Chris Taylor, it was the demonstration model built for the federal government and made very close to the vault headquarters. Eventually, it became home to the master, whose followers reside in the cathedral above it. It was less impressive than the corporate vaults and met the same fate, which, considering the master's mission to rid the world of humans, was for the best. Described in game as a budget vault, the makeshift vault was designed by disgruntled vault contractors once they learned they wouldn't be receiving spots in any vaults due to being deemed unessential. So they stole material from Appalachian vault construction sites and made a vault of their own. Obviously the contractors were desperate, but you have to consider that they didn't know the true nature of the vaults. They were willingly stealing parts that they thought were meant for safety shelters, which in turn could have delayed construction on those vaults until it was too late. Simply put, the making of the makeshift vaults was definitely immoral. Sadly, it ended up being all for nothing. The crew did not survive, although the makeshift vault would go on to be used in the future, first by raiders and then the Brotherhood of Steel. Depending on how you see things, that might not have been a happy ending after all. The Museum of Technology exhibit vault was displayed in Washington DC's Museum of Technology. It was built as a demonstration model to showcase the supposed safety of vaults and fool visitors into registering for them. I had some commenters tell me that the museum or the vault made specific reference to vault tech space colonization. But honestly, I couldn't find anything about that. The space history we learn about doesn't pertain to vault tech as far as we know, but we do get a pretty devious bit of false advertising. Owned by Mr. House, the Securitron Vault housed an army of Securitrons to ensure his domination over New Vegas. Mr. House is an autocrat. He is one man with absolute power, and he uses it to seize control and manifest his worldview. Whether that's evil or not will come down to you. But personally, I think building a vault filled with living weapons was a dangerous move. Mr. House didn't initially have access to the Securitron Vault, and while he did spend enormous amounts of money trying to find the missing platinum chip to control it, this doesn't change the fact that anyone could have gotten their hands on the chip. Anyone could have used the vaults to gain their own personal army and guaranteed their rulership in a chunk of the wasteland, which could have gone poorly in the wrong hands. Vaultopolis, or Vault 525 in Fallout Shelter, was hidden inside the Red Rocket headquarters. Red Rocket was a pre-war filling station chain, which according to the Fallout board game, took on a mythic influence over people of the wasteland, turning it into an icon of the safety and prosperity of a vanished age. Rumors circulated of Vultopolis being built beneath the company's headquarters, although as we learn from its dwellers upon entering the place, few could find it, for it is utopia. That's, um, pretty creepy, but the place seems to be working alright, and the people are friendly enough, if a little boastful. It is utopia, may your vault grow to be as amazing as ours. Yeah, I hope. In terms of testing, I'm pretty sure Vultopolis either serves as another control vault, or it was meant for vault tech faculty and staff like the corporate vault. They also see themselves as a utopia the same way Vault 8 sees itself as one. And while Vaultopolis is giving to fellow Vault Dwellers, I have to wonder if they're just as kind towards Wastelanders. 
So you mean to tell me that only few people could find Voltopolis if it's rumored to be underneath the literal Red Rocket HQ? Few could find it because it's a utopia? That just sounds unhinged. Whatever's going on here, I've gone through too many vaults to keep my guard down. Something's definitely off about this place. Built in Morgantown, Appalachia, vault University was the town's local college, which the corporation rebranded and reorchestrated into becoming a learning ground for future vault employees. And inside that university was a training vault, the closest simulation to actual vault life that vault could provide outside of a real vault. This wasn't any ordinary demonstration vault or piece of false advertising. This was the real deal and overseer candidates were expected to propose experiment ideas and carry them out as their senior thesis. Students were used as a test population, and data was collected from the training vault the same as any other vault. Some of the thesis proposals included an experiment for determining the ability of canines to form a self-governing society, which got rejected, and an experiment for determining the optimal density of calories in a foodstuff versus storage space as well as the tolerance of one's ability to consume food of unvarying texture. This later experiment posed by student Drew Collingsworth got the go-ahead by the school's dean, Harlan Elliott. But there were some modifications made. Note that the initial plan, while out there, was meant to be scientific and somewhat benevolent. Though the experimental group would only be able to eat food paste, they were also supposed to be able to design their own flavors. It probably wouldn't have helped much, but the thought counts. Then you see the training vaults and it's... Turns out, while Mr. Elliot liked the vault proposal, he thought it could be made better. Collingsworth's proposed experiment has evolved beyond my wildest expectations. His initial proposal mirrored other successful food replacement schemes and even showed a little imagination for once. I pushed him towards a more interesting experiment that should test the general willpower of individuals and how they react to deaths caused by food supply. I've tasted his pastes, they're suitably horrible, so we're going to mass produce them and add an arterial placking agent that should cause rapid circulatory system decline. I expect a full-blown revolt within two weeks and we should be able to end the experiment in the middle of week three. Collingsworth was unaware of the changes made to the paste and became overseer of the test vault on October 15th, 2077, eight days before the bombs fell. On October 16th, the dwellers arrived, being comprised of fellow students. The Great War was felt on the 23rd, which was described like an earthquake that caused a temporary loss of power before the backup generators were activated. Collingsworth thought the incident was part of some drill, and even commented that his people performed admirably during the situation. But on October 26th, things began to go south. A heart attack. Sudden and out of nowhere, one of the maintenance staff died in the middle of his workday. I'm waiting on the coroner's report before I make any decisions. The autopsy report came out the next day, revealing hardened and cracked arterial walls of the heart. In response, Kongsworth ordered a medical review of his test groups, and when he found that the food paste formulation was causing arterial plaque buildup, he ordered the dwellers to take stock of the remaining standard issue food. But there was a big problem with that. The food paste had been so bad that unbeknownst to Collingsworth, a black market had already formed around standard rations. By the time he issued the order to make the food switch, there was only two days left of regular, non-life-threatening food. Collingsworth wanted to be an overseer. He was a passionate, bright student who worked hard to be where he was. Failure of his vault experiment would mean an end to his dream. But desperate as he was, once he realized that there was no workaround solution, once the rations were depleted even faster than the two-day estimation, and that his fellow dwellers were in danger, Collingsworth decided 
to end the training vault. I'm going to signal my advisor and cancel the test. I can't take the chance that we're going to lose anyone else. There was no response, yet the dwellers didn't believe Collingsworth. They threatened him. They said they were going to storm his office, and sure enough, they began to drill towards him. Locking himself in his bedroom, Collingsworth made his final log entry on November 2nd, 2077. They've breached the outer seal and are at the door to my office. I can hear the drill operating. It will take them days to get through, but I can't take the chance. I don't know why my advisors aren't responding. People are dying here, and more are going to die, and there's nothing I can do about it. This will be my final entry before I barricade myself in my bedroom, in the hopes that I can outlast the timed locks. God willing, this is just part of the test. Something tells me it's not. Testing the willpower of people and seeing their reactions to death caused by food supply was the purpose of the training vault's final experiment. We can see how order would rapidly fall apart in such a scenario through the vault's fate, whose data could have gone into determining just how quickly that would be. Maybe you'd have seen the likes of additional precautions, rationing protocols, or stricter punishments for black market trade come about on board the generation ship as a result. But most certainly, vault would have learned that a lack of consumable food is a nightmare situation. Up.